Hello, my name is John Reynolds. On this episode of Extraordinary Life Stories, I'm talking with entrepreneur and world record holder, Rob Wiley. Rob is an exited entrepreneur who lives in Sandbanks, a place very close to my heart. He and his son Morgan are the first people to cross the English Channel non-stop on an e-foil board called Flightboard. As world record holders, they completed the 23 mile journey on one battery life, crossing in one hour and 44 minutes. I want to know how Rob came to finding out about a flight board and investing. Rob clearly loves a challenge, and with timing so important in life, what's next for Rob? I'm very much looking forward to talking to you. Rob, welcome. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for inviting me. It's great to be here. Cool. Tell me, who is Rob Wiley? <sighs> who is Rob Wiley? Um, even though I knew you were going to ask that question, <laughs> it's still a difficult one to answer. I'm, I'm going to answer it in a really simple way, which is um, husband, father, uh, backpack innovator, businessman, and world record holder. Not too many people can say that. And it's no. not for how many paper clips I can put in my mouth or something like that. It's, it's something meaningful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I love it. Let me take you back to a young Rob growing up. What yeah. did you aspire to do? What did you want to be when you were growing up? Ever since, um, ever, ever since I can remember, I always wanted to be a pilot. That's what I really kind of aimed towards. Uh, my dad was in the RAF, and I, I thought I was going to ask you what the inspiration was. Yeah, 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 and I thought that was that was my, and I loved planes, so that yeah. I was absolutely obsessed by planes. But I actually didn't end up becoming a pilot because um, uh, I failed my, um, or I got a D at maths O level, so that stopped me from sort of progressing any further. But in a way, that actually kind of did me a bit of a favour because I didn't end up going down that road. So, but no. that's, that's what I wanted to be up until that age. It's interesting, because that correlation of success and failure and the things that don't work out, it's not stopped you. In fact, it's not stopped you not only having an amazing life and being successful, but actually flying. But we're gonna, we're gonna come to that. Flying yeah, water. right, yeah. So you've, you've got your D, you, you, you're not gonna be a pilot. Where, where did the trajectory go from there? Yeah, I didn't really know what I was going to do from that point onwards. I, I, I started doing an engineering course um, and I, I wasn't really sort of that motivated to mm. do that. And then I did what most people did, you know, kind of at that age, you know, going out and partying and that kind of thing. That was really my priority. Mm -hmm. um, and then eventually I decided I needed to sort of knuckle down and get a job and sort of concentrate on, on, on the future. And that's when I, uh, in a way, I would say I stumbled into it being in the outdoor industry. I, yeah. I, I was looking for a job. Um, some, I was into outdoor sports. Um, and then I came across this job that was a assistant manager at an outdoor store in Guildford. And yep. I thought, well, I don't really know a lot about retail, but I'll, I'll, I'll go along to the interview. Got along really well with the manager and he hired me as the assistant manager. And then yeah. within, within six months, he was promoted to be the area manager and we got on so well and I'd done such a good job. He made me the manager of the store and then I ended up being the manager of the, the biggest store in, in London, which was um, Black's, probably a lot of people know that. So yeah. not far from here, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, just near Chancery Lane Tube Station. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's how I first got into the outdoor industry. So you married, um, you obviously, you know, mentioned the manager liked you got on and so on. there's a people connection and then the fact that you liked recreational sports and yeah. actually managed to even though you didn't know what you wanted to do you married the two together to exactly send you that. on that path yeah, yeah yeah and i think that was a that was a big part of my motivation in doing that is i was doing something that i really enjoyed yeah and it didn't really feel like work um even though i was working really hard but yeah. it did at the time i didn't realize the sort of building blocks that it was giving me of the sort of business sense and, and and you know building those foundations of yes. what was to come even though i didn't know no, of what, course. What, what to come what what that was going to look like no i get that and actually so at that point you're getting this experience but you're ultimately employed yeah, there's a transition from being employed to becoming an entrepreneur. Talk to me about True, that. True. Yeah. Well, I I still I look I look on it now as my apprenticeship, um, but I didn't think of it as an apprenticeship at the time. I was just interested in doing something that I believed in sure. and doing something that I felt I would enjoy. Um, so after uh, about three years in re outdoor retail, um, I was offered a job to go and work for an outdoor brand. Um, as a sales guy, and I thought that was a logical step because I'd learned really as much as I could learn about, sure. about retail. After a period of time, I became aware of this um, small startup brand in San Francisco that was uh, founded by a couple of um, outdoor industry veterans from mm. the US, and I got involved with them, and I ended up working for them for six years, uh, which was an amazing experience. And that's where I really, that's where my 
entrepreneurial uh, side really sort of took off and that and I say that because I was very fortunate that one of the one of the founders of this company he really kind of took me under his wing and he he, he mentored me and taught me all about production in Asia and taught me all about product design and the design process and mm. you know I'm really I'm really grateful to him and I, I I suppose looking back on it, I took it a bit for granted at the time because I thought, well, isn't everybody mentored by a US outdoor industry veteran? Um, uh, and I don't know why I thought that. It's kind of stupid. Well, it's your life. You, you, it, yeah, 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 exactly. So that company was Mountain Hardware. Um, and uh, yeah, I gained a lot of experience uh, working uh, in that role for mm. six years. I was a really small shareholder uh, in the company, tiny, um, but it was nice to have some form of ownership. And I think that gave me also a feeling of what it would be like to have my own company, you know, like, like yeah. this is my table, these are my chairs, this is my brand. Yeah. You know? um, and that kind of gave me a bit of an appetite to want to push that further. Yeah, but the, 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 the blend from actually making that decision to walk away from you know, being paid every month and, and yeah. having that security to actually taking the, the funds to be an entrepreneur, it's, it scares a lot of people. There's a lot of people that potentially may well be very capable or have an opportunity, but they don't take the funds. You did. So what was it like for you? I did. and and, and Honestly speaking, I don't, th I, I didn't, I don't think that I found it scary. I, th I found it exciting, cool, um, because I really believed that what I was doing was the right thing to do. The company that I was working for had just been because these these two outdoor industry veterans, um, Paul Kramer and Jack Gilbert, um, uh, they were basically selling the company before mm. they retired. So it was their like kind of like their last chapter, as yeah. It were. But it wasn't my last chapter. Yeah. Um, but they were selling to Columbia Sportswear. Um, and I really didn't want to work for a big, you know, sort of multi-billion uh, dollar mm. uh, company and become a small cog in the in the wheel. Sure. Um, uh, and it was around about that time. This is sort of early two thousands, and I became uh, aware of a really small uh, backpack brand in the US called Osprey. Um, uh, I loved the product, loved the design. Um, met the guy who founded it, a guy called Mike Fortnow. And again, like it was a bit like history repeating itself. I got on with him amazingly well, as most people would, because he's a great guy. Um, we shared so much in common. And I really thought, well, there's a really great opportunity here to mm. sell Osprey in Europe and help you expand um, the brand around the world. And fortunately, I think he saw that potential in me as well. Um, people um, we by went, people. Yeah, they do. And we went, we basically went into partnership together. Mm. So back then the company was tiny and it was on its knees and, you know, it really, they really didn't have very much runway before the company would probably have to change ownership anyway. So it was yeah. a, I'm not saying it was the last roll of the dice for him, but it probably wasn't far off the last roll of the dice. Yeah. Um, but we managed to really turn that um, turn that around and turn Osprey into something really, you know, a, a, a global uh, force yeah. in, in the backpack world. I mean, obviously not overnight. No. It took really sort of 15 years, but by the time I exited, um, uh, we were turning over about $250 million uh, globally. Awesome. And, and Ralph Fiennes, didn't he go up Everest with one? He did. did. Yeah, 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 he did. Yeah, just, yeah. yeah, There's a story, right? Um, yeah, so many people used our yeah. backpacks and you see them obviously, you know, walking around London, you see yeah. so many and through airports and all that kind of thing. Do you get a bit of pride from that? Did you have that moment where I, it's just quietly, you wouldn't be wearing that if it wasn't for me? I still do, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just came back from a week in uh, um, uh, Courchevel and obviously you see a lot of people skiing with Absolutely. backpacks on there. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you, I mean, obviously I'm still interested in, in, in the backpack world. So yeah. I, t I kind of take notice of that kind of, of thing. Of that revenue, that global revenue, Europe was a really meaningful slice of it, mm. and that, that was uh, that that was uh, predominantly my company. Um, even though I was in partnership with the US guys, and I uh, I sold that in two thousand eighteen. Yeah, um, congratulations, so I, thank you. Because that yeah. whole exited entrepreneur sort of things. I mean, how many people are striving to do that? Yeah, difficult is it? And that's probably my question to you because there's so many people that. That they've started a business and of course there's an emotional attachment to, to it at times but ultimately you know either, either you're looking to exit um, with a sale or someone comes to you with a, an offer you can't refuse mm -hmm. how difficult was that for it was really difficult i mean i never started the company thinking how how fast can i grow this mm. to sell it um you know when you get when you're so emotionally invested in it and you're so um uh, you know uh, you know it's your every day you know mm. it's what you're doing every day it's your baby right sure you know, you, you, you're not thinking when can i get rid of this child yeah um, absolutely. and uh um when i was first approached to um buy the company my initial response was you know crazy you know why why would i want to do that and i wasn't even thinking about the money i was just thinking about like this just doesn't feel like the right time for yep. me i sort of thought about it a little bit and obviously uh, discussed it with um discussed it with my partner as in, as a wife um 
And then after thinking of all the reasons why I shouldn't, I then started, and we then started to discuss all the reasons why that might be a good time to do it. Mm. And obviously they were pushing me as well because they wanted to, they wanted to buy. So they were, they were giving yeah. me all the reasons of, you know, it's always good to finish at the top and, you know, look at the great job you've done, and, yeah. you know. Do you think it helped in the negotiation? Almost like reverse psychology where genuinely this guy doesn't want to sell. We're going to have to potentially pay more and to try harder to buy this company. They were, I knew how keen they were to buy it because I, um, you, uh, but at the same time, um, I didn't know how keen I was to sell it. Um, but we managed to reach, I'm cutting a very long story short here, but over a six month, six to nine month period. Negotiation, um, we managed yeah. to reach a, a conclusion on that. So. Came into a bunch of money, which was nice. Yep. Took some time out. I had to sign a five-year non-compete, so I wouldn't do anything to do with backpacks at all. Okay. Um, and uh, I thought, why would I want to do that? Yeah, um, done uh, that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We'll get, we'll get to that. <laughs> we'll get to that. Um, and uh, did what most other people would do, you know, took, took some time off. Uh, we traveled around the, around Asia. Um, we bought a boat in Mallorca. Um, and we were living, you know, without any sort of ties to business or home or work um, yeah. and just sort of lived life uh, sort of fancy free and uh, and like I say most people would aspire to do that but it 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 after after getting some order into that world yeah and then obviously you come into a bunch of money you can't just put it under your bed you've got to do something with it so that that's quite a, that's quite a job to get all of that yeah. invested and, and securing our, our future for uh, for our family that was I didn't realize it at the time but that was basically a turn into my job you know, it's like, sort of, um, yeah. is what do we do with this now? What yeah. now? Um, and then once you get all that squared away, and once all that's working, all of a sudden I suddenly realised there was a big void. So you had, you also had no purpose, because the purpose previously completely. was getting that company set up. Yeah, it was then negotiating over the six nine months to get the best deal, and then, yeah. and then you and had I, the purpose for family. It sounds like you would have had some amazing life experiences. Yeah, really good. But did you have that experience then, where you were like, oh my god, I need to be doing something? I did, but that and that is something that a lot of people have told me. Oh, you're going to get bored, yeah. um, you know. And I was like, oh, no way! I will always find, you know, whether I go, even if I go surfing every day, I'm yeah. not going to get bored. No. Um, but I think it's that lack of belonging, like that yeah. lack of like you're not having to pe people aren't having to come to you and ask you your opinion on things. Yeah, you know, you're not, you're not, you're not, you don't have to show anyone any leadership other than within your family. Yeah. Um, uh, what restaurant are we go to today? That's not really leadership. Yeah. You know, it's it it. I, I think it did leave leave a bit of a hole. And, and you know, and I was I was 49 at the time, so obviously you know I was fairly fairly young. I would say to to retire. Um, and I was very fortunate that um, uh, this sounds like a real first world problem. Um, don't worry, I'm not going to start crying. Um, uh, but I was very fortunate we were on our boat in Mallorca and um, uh, this would have been in the summer 2019, so yep. before COVID. Um, and then I saw this guy come whizzing past on this um, flying surfboard, whizzing across the water. I'd never seen one before, didn't even know what it was. Um, and, uh, and he silently came past and I just thought, I, I don't know what that is, but I have to have one. Um, that's everything that I love. I'd love to be the fly on the wall, it. your face. Right. Oh, it's that! Crazy. I, yeah, did yeah. you dive in? Did you get, jump I on think, a jet ski and chase him down? Yeah, I think I'd, I'd just come, uh, something on the boat stopped working. I'd just come out of the engine room as yeah. well, and it was all hot and sweaty down there. And then yeah. I, I sort of put my head above the, the side of the boat to to to, to be uh, confronted with this sight. I mean, it was it was mind blowing, yeah. and everything that uh, excites me all in one yep. thing. Um, so I did a quick Google, found out it was a flight board, ordered a flight board. Unfortunately, they'd only just launched, so um, uh, it took about eight or nine months for mine to get delivered. Yeah. Um, and so I became a customer first and foremost. Yeah. Um, loved it. Um, it was everything I hoped it would be and more. Uh, uh, eventually, they, I, th I think I was being kind of like the annoying guy from the UK. So they were like, oh, we, sh we should put you on to David, our founder. Because well, lots think, of questions. Yeah, I think he's the best person and to feedback. answer feedback. Yeah, and um, yeah. it's really weird how that all worked because David, um, similar age to me, similar love of the water, yeah. um, very entrepreneurial guy as well. And we super hit it off straight away. And, uh, and I said to David, look, I really believe in this product. It's mm. a beautiful product that you've made. Um, I really believe in the company and I really believe where this sport can go. Yeah. Um, so if you if there is ever an opportunity to invest, um, then let me know. 
And it just so happened they were actually in a round of um, funding. You make your own open, timing. Yeah, not open funding, but it was within the current base of yeah. shareholders, which are like the the, the guy who uh, founded Zero, for example, the accountancy software is one yeah. of the, one of the um, one of the shareholders. So they didn't really need to go elsewhere for money. They had plenty plenty of yeah. that available. And they brought me in, or David brought me in as a as the one new shareholder to join this group, which was. Uh, but your passion and enthusiasm and value add in that sense of exited entrepreneur probably rub, rubbed off on David massively, right? I I think it did, yeah, and certainly his passion and and value add rubbed off on me as well, and um, yeah. and and I'm forever indebted to him because he he without even realising it he he gave me that bridge yes. that bridge from Osprey into the new my new world yeah uh, he provided me that and I'm I'm like I say I'm really forever indebted to him because yeah. he he basically with Flightboard and with all the work that I did with him and 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 the sort of it gave me that itch that I could scratch again yeah and also do something that I really believed in not just on a on a on a on a business level but also product level as well um, marketing and just sort of brand um, sort of brand elevation level um, so I was I wasn't just an investor with them I was also a, a, a brand ambassador as well yeah and, uh, and and you took that to the extreme you're a world record holder yeah because in terms of brand ambassador yeah and probably someone that loves a challenge yeah yeah, you crossed the channel on a flight board on one battery? On one battery, yeah. Yeah, so it was about an With hour your son, and, I should add. Yeah, it was about an hour and 45 minute journey. Yeah. Um, and uh, we'd been planning it for a really uh, long time. So we did that in August 21. Yeah. Um, and uh, it never been done before. Was and it your idea? Yes, yeah. That doesn't yeah. surprise me. Well, we started doing some rides and seeing how long we could get a battery to last if we if we sort of had optimum conditions. Mm. And, um, and then started to think, hmm, hang on a minute. The English Channel is about the same distance as this, and how could we how could we do right. it? Um, and it was it was a really difficult it was a physical challenge, but it was also a really difficult logistical challenge as well. And that, um, well, coordinating with France and stuff and ships, everything, the weather, uh, you know, the tides obviously as well. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a there's an absolutely ferocious tide uh, in the English Channel that a lot of people don't realise. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like a nine meter yeah. difference, peak to peak to bottom, so you can't get across the channel. That's why if you look on a on a map of the swimmers, I mean, hats off to anyone who swam yeah. on this channel. Yeah. That, that's a long way. Yeah. Um, you, if you look on a map of the swimmers, they're, they're swimming like this. They don't swim, swim in a straight line because the, the tide is pushing Fighting in and out. It. Yeah, so we had to take that into account as well. Yeah. We got uh, buzzed by a uh, UK Border Force drone. Um, uh, it was quite exciting. We yeah, got a, a French helicopter followed us. French uh, coastal helicopter followed us for a while yep. as well, but it was it was amazing to do that crossing. I don't think anybody's done it since, or some, certainly nobody's. No one's unhinged about it. enough to do it. Well, maybe, but I, I <laughs> think the battery also, like gets I think also off. politically that that stretch yeah. of water now is such a political. Might be quite spot. a nice safe record actually in context. I think it probably probably will be for That's a while. Good. But an interesting point about that is that. Um, when we crossed the uh, English Channel by EFOIL, um, 112 years prior to that, Louis Blériot first flew across oh, the English Channel in an aeroplane. So, did you have that in your mind at all, or did you find out after? Afterwards? Only afterwards. Ah. Only afterwards, I checked out when the yeah. first flight over the English Channel was. And when you think about it, 112 years—it's not that long. No, it's not. No, uh, well, innovation. You know, um, crazy. I think he crashed at the other end as well. So, whereas uh, we did you didn't. crash on the beach? You elegantly stepped off. Yeah, yeah. I think I was whooping in the water like. Yeah, uh, no, it's an awesome achievement. Like right. Sly Stallone and yeah. everybody looking at me like I was just escaped from a mental hospital. Yeah, but I was I was very pleased to feel that gravel under my feet. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. And so, from a flight board point of view, you you're actually an exited entrepreneur again. You've done it again. Yes, because I'm I'm uh, as I explained earlier, I invested in Flightboard, and then Flightboard was sold in September last year, so t uh, September 23 yeah. to a company called Brunswick, who um, a US Nasdaq company. Well, who, congratulations. Uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So they own Mercury, Simrad, lots of marine brands. So Flightboard just really logically fits into yeah. their kind of portfolio of of brands and where they see the future of sort of water sports. Yeah. No, obviously, well done. In context of Rob yourself, mm. um, and how you keep physically fit and mentally fit, clearly the love of water sports and, and the fact that I can tell you are physically fit, so there's, there's obviously things that you do. I'd love to know if you've got a kind of morning routine and what you try and do and then how you keep mentally fit because I can tell you're, you're laser focused, you know, there's a, a positive mindset about you. Do, you. do you work with that? Do you read? Do you listen to podcasts? Do you sort of follow that growth mindset as well as keeping physically fit? 
Yeah, I think that um, obviously, as you know, I have a great love of the water, so I think that, yeah. keep, that keeps me physically fit. I've, um, uh, I also box twice a week as well. Yeah, um, and uh, I, I love that because it's it, it's not just a physical thing; it's very physical, but um, uh, it also you have to be mentally uh, agile as well as physically yeah. agile. And I think that's that's one of the one of the things I really like about boxing, and also the competitiveness of it mm -hmm. as well. Um, but I don't; I'm not a big podcast listen type okay. person um uh and i'm not really sure why because i like hearing about business stories and and like hearing about people's journeys and that yeah. kind of thing I, I i don't really know um maybe i don't have the time to do it or or just i, I think when i'm you, you said about the focus if i'm doing something I like if tell. i'm working or something like that and then i don't yeah, I even around find having it. music on in the background is is, is distracting you know I prefer to be more sort of um, sort of laser focused on what I'm doing. And what about that kind of I mentioned that sort of morning routine some people swear by being successful in business you know I'm up at the five o'clock in the morning. And I'm, I'm definitely finished. not that. Are you not? That's no, good to no. know. I think that's good for anyone maybe. watching listening uh, today because it, it does seem that that's constantly if you want to be successful and so on that's what you've got to do and actually there's a question for you. I have a friend who does that. He get he gets up and runs. I, like I've got friends in miles yeah. every morning. Yeah, I get that, and it works there. for them. Yeah, but I like the fact that you 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 do the things that work for you, but you don't have to be up at crazy o'clock. Yeah, and so on. but you've achieved um, success. Yeah, sitting here now, what is your definition of success? I think my definition of success would be when you've achieved something that you set out to achieve. I think then you could say you were successful in that, whatever that might be. Yeah. Um, but I also think as well, the true success or the true meaning of success is what you learn along the way. So I appreciate um, the journey. Definitely. And that's my kind of like my, I didn't come up with this. I think I stole it from somebody else, but the journey is the reward. So that's my, that's my sort of mantra that I like yeah. to live by. Um, uh, because I think sometimes, especially in the modern world, you know, you can be very focused on the, you know, getting to a point where I can say, oh, I've done this now. Yes. Now what's next? Yes. You know, not actually appreciating everything that you, you, you've no, you've done that. and learned along the yeah. way. Yeah, and, and a lot of people don't live in that present moment, do they? They're all about the goal. And I'm terrible for that. So yeah. I really have to sort of stop myself. And, and But you've uh, learned that through maturity, perspective, and your own experiences. And actually yeah. flipping that to, you were, you were really complimentary about the fact that you had a mentor. Yeah. And um, the experiences that you've now had, do you find yourselves look at yourself looking to almost help and mentor other entrepreneurs, you know, potentially even investing in businesses that um, take your interest and that, that nurturing, mentoring side of things, giving back? Yes. Yeah. Um, I thought you in, in fact, that's, um, you know, a big thing that I'm, uh, I'm a big new journey in a way. And, mm. and, and it's, it's, it's kind of strange how things have worked out is that sort of for, for everything to come full circle is that um, uh, obviously since the flight board sale, uh, I was then thinking, well, what now, you know, what's going to fill, yep. what's going to fill that void. Um, and my five year non-compete had run out of uh, not being able to go into anything backpack related. And then a brand, a UK based brand uh, who are based in London, actually, um, called Stubble & Co. that came onto my radar as like a really cool brand. They've got a really cool product. Um, and, uh, you know, they obviously seem to be growing. And I, I, I reached out to them got on I mean it's almost like sort of history repeating yeah. itself got on really well with the two founders husband husband and wife team There's a pattern. Um, and uh, um, after some discussions back and forth um, uh, eventually they asked me to be their chairman so mm. um, that uh, uh, that's a sort of new journey that I'm going on helping which is something I've done before which is um, yeah. helping build a global successfully backpack, improven as well brand and yeah um, I do I do think I hate to use the word mentoring because it almost it, it almost seems like I kind of like I'm looking down on them, which I'm which I'm definitely not. But um, I think that um, I think that they can definitely um, benefit from a lot of the experiences that I've had. Um, yeah, and I think also as well when you when you're when you're mentoring somebody or or you're investing in a company or it goes for any partnership really, the the person that you're talking to has to have has to want to hear your message, right? Mm. You know, that, uh, I think if if you go into it with um, your ears are open, their ears are open, you know, and you have a, a, a clear and easy dialogue like like you and I do, then, yeah. then you know, there's a lot there's a lot of benefit that can come from that. Yeah, well, you've articulated that really well. And actually, in context of being um, an entrepreneur that's exited, uh, enjoying that kind of sense of purpose you've now got with the, the next venture, um, what advice would you give? To an aspiring entrepreneur now in the climate we've got where there's you know we've just just officially entered into a recession in the uk yeah. and and so on you know with that perspective you've got 
Yeah, what advice would you give to someone that's looking to set out on that entrepreneurial journey? I would, I would say find something, um, find something obviously that you feel that you're really good at mm. um, and something you can make a difference in. I would say uh, successful people, in my opinion, they always obsess the details um, yeah. and really make sure that everything works um, as efficiently and smoothly as it can. So with a focus on um, systems and processes, that kind of thing. If you set if you set systems and processes up, then you can. That's all the kind of the 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 sort of cogs, if you like, in yeah. the engine. And then the creativity is the sort of flair that you can put around it. And I think I think if systems and processes work really well, then you've got headspace for creativity. Yeah. Um, and uh, you should never let creativity run systems and processes. Yeah. Also, I think if if you're fortunate enough, like I was, to um, find something that you really enjoy doing it's great advice. um then um you know then i know it's a bit of a cliche that you you know then you're not working a day you can't life, hear it enough i think it, there's lots of times where i've thought like oh you, you know geez why am i doing this but mm. then but then it's your um then it's your determination in what you're doing and your belief in what you're doing that gets you through it i don't think just enjoying it is enough because obviously in any journey there's there's, it, there's yeah. ups and downs aren't you got to be you got to be ready to battle through that. yeah exactly and i would also advise to anyone who's uh, you know sort of in the early stages of um setting out on business as well forget about the end you know really the end or the exit is that's that's just a byproduct of doing everything really well mm. and and if, if you're too focused on the end i think you end up losing focus of, of, of what's actually yeah. going to make the difference and what's yeah. going to be really important all right, I, I get that. And actually, I've just been reflecting on the conversation. There's a pattern with um, flight board and then the challenge, someone that loves a challenge and that almost that sort of brand ambassador marketing opportunity that became crossing the channel. How do you see that panning out with Stubble & Co with the bag? Have you got anything in mind that's uh, not necessarily a world record, but there's a something brewing? We're like, oh, I could do that. I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. Some some. I might be too early in, uh, in yeah, your maybe. journey. Yeah, maybe. You'll have Watch to let me know. Yeah yeah. yeah, 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 exactly. Um, I mean, you can you can never have too many bags or shoes, right? You know, Absolutely. So, uh, well, you know, I'm sure my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Different sure kind of bag, but yeah. <laughs> there's, uh, I'm sure there's lots of creative things that we can come up with. Um, you know, and that, that's that's the exciting thing. I mean, when yeah. you put when you put um, you know kind of um, people who have got passion for something, yeah. put them together in a, in a room and say, okay, what are we going to do? Um, yeah. You know, that that's where the you know that's where the real magic happens, isn't it? And you, that's when you can come up with that's yeah. sort of two plus two equals five. Yeah. You know, because because it just it's such a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, I've really enjoyed talking to you. We run out of time, and I could talk to you for a lot longer. But thank you, John. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your journey, what you're doing, and absolute best of luck with the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Rob. Thank you. Thanks. Cheers.